everyone. Welcome. Sun is shining, right, Jesse? Is it shining? Welcome, kids. If you want to come get a seat, we're going to worship the Lord together. We need your help. We need your loud voices and dance moves and everything. So come grab a seat. Squish in. There's lots on the outside. Come on in. Welcome. We want to worship the Lord this morning together. Um, one thing that was on my heart was just that song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. And as you fix your eyes and your gaze on Jesus, that he would open our hearts to him, that, that everything of the week that's weighing on us, anything that's distracting us, that he just wants your gaze this morning. He wants to just look at you. He loves you. And so we want to worship the King of Kings. So why don't you stand? Just be free of worship. <laughs> Yes. 
redemption and he is our prize drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes his grace it is an ocean where all sinking and heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss in my heart turns violently inside my chest and I don't have time to drink, take me to rest when I think about the way that he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. the melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemy till all my fears are gone you unravel as you unravel me 
I don't have much else to say to that this morning. Um, how great is our God? That's that's why we're here. That's it's why we live and move and we exist. Um, that's how great our God is. morning as I was praying, what do we pray about together? Um, the question that kept coming up in my mind is, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Um, the lawyers of Israel asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Um, and that's where we get the story of the Good Samaritan and all that. And so this morning, I just want to encourage you just to, as we contemplate how great our God is, just get together with your family, with the people that are sitting next to you, and just ask God who is that he has for you this week. Who's the person that needs to know how great our God is? The person who needs to know how loved they are. Who needs to know that they are a child of God. Whether they believe it or not, that's who they are and that's who their identity is. So let's just take a moment and just contemplate those things and ask God who he, who he would have for you this week and who your eyes need to be open to this week. Welcome, everybody, this morning. We have lots of friends and family here this morning. We've got a pretty special morning coming up in a little bit with, as we recognize and honor baby Asher. Um, but just before we get to that, a couple of announcements to be made aware of. So coming up on April 22nd, we have our financial feedback meeting where we just kind of let you know how things are, how the admin and day-to-day -day stuff of the church is going. If you'd like to attend, it's going to be online. Um, you can find that through the app or on the website, and we would love to just chat through any of those kinds of things with you if you're interested. So that's on April 22nd. And then on April 26th, we have Kindle at the Sweets House at 7 o'clock, and so it's just a time of just enjoying being in community, in presence, and just worshiping in a less formal setting and just sort of seeing where, how the spirit moves and just enjoying being there. So that's April 26th at the Sweets. Um, this is a very important announcement for parents. On a normal Sunday, we ask the kids not go on stage. Please take extra care and be reminded that we need to make sure of that this morning. You can't see it because we've hidden it, but they're getting ready for their play. And there's a ton of hardware lumber and all this kind of stuff on the stage so we want to just keep everybody safe so please nobody on the stage this morning that would be fantastic all right well as i alluded to we've got a special morning so i'm going to invite the sweets and john to come up and we get to hear a little bit more about baby asher this morning oh john reminded me I'll do it now. Um, well, they're coming up. Just a reminder, too, we have our tithes and offerings this morning. So if this is your home, if this is your body, we just ask that you would consider what God is asking you to give this morning. And uh, you can do that online. There's the basket. There's, there's different ways. So, yeah. Okay. Now the fun part. Uh, all right. Welcome, sweets. 
It's our honor to uh, stand together as a family as uh, Joel and Sonia dedicate Little Asher. And uh, first just wanted to say that uh, this is a very beautiful sign of, of God's heart. God's heart is that every little boy and girl grows up in a family where they're loved by a mom and a dad who are going to advocate for them, who are going to love them, who are going to love them enough to discipline them, who are going to watch out for them and pray for them uh, and stand ahead of them for the things that come against them in this world. Um, and, and there are many, many uh, parents who drop the ball in that regard, and there are many kids who grow up without that. And God's heart is to be a father to the fatherless. Uh, but this is a symbol to us of God's heart and God's love uh, to have a little boy uh, brought into this kind of environment that was prayed for, that was cared for, that was loved for, that was sought after, um, that was prepared for. And, uh, and so it's our honor as a family to stand here as they dedicate him. I want to encourage you, uh, they are dedicating him to the Lord, but they're also dedicating themselves to his service, to, to stand in the gap, to be those parents that God has designed. Uh, we all recognize our own uh, shortcomings, and, uh, and, and yet uh, we realize that God is the father over all of us. He is the over father, um, and that he works in us and overcomes our shortcomings. And so there's a beauty when we, when we dedicate not just uh, our little ones but ourselves to say, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to stand in the gap. I'm going to stand before you. I'm going to love you in a way that is beyond me. I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to stand for God's best in your life. Without further ado, Joel and Sonia have something they prepared. Asher Corin, we thank God for giving you to us. We are so blessed to be your parents, and you are a delight and a gift to our family. Your name, Asher, means blessed and happy, and you are truly one of the happiest little ones we have ever known. <laughs> you are also named after your uncle, Asari, who loved the Lord, and we pray that you would walk in his footsteps. Our prayer for you is that God would bless you as one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. We pray that you would be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields in fruit its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, and that whatever you do would prosper. That's from Psalm 1. There are so many beautiful passages of scripture surrounding the word blessed that we hope you'll make a full study of it someday. <laughs> we pray that as you grow, God will increase your reliance on him for knowing and living in his presence is the greatest blessing. as we prayed about your second name, Corin, we were talking about our love for the story it comes from, The Horse and His Boy, by C.S. Lewis. Father highlighted for me that this story is about two brothers. Sorry if you haven't read it yet. This is a spoiler alert, I suppose. <laughs> one who discovers he is a son of the king and one who always knows his identity. We named you Corin because he was a son who always knew he was a son of the king. We pray that you will receive the love of God and enter into your identity as a beloved child of the king. We are so proud of you, our son, and we love you so much. We pray that you will be someone that leads others to discover their true identity in father. As you grow up in our home and we seek to demonstrate God's heart to you, we pray that you would know what God's heart was for the oldest son in the story of the prodigal son from Luke 15, 31. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. May you pursue and celebrate the returning of the sons to the father from a place of peace and security in your position as a son in the house. We love you, Asher Corin, sweet. 
and we dedicate ourselves to love and guide you to the one who is always faithful. Jean Tonya, it's my pleasure to present you with this certificate and the storybook Bible. And we're going to pray uh, with you and just confirm uh, God's blessing over your little one. Just, just thank you for that. And I, w- I want to encourage you, church, as we do that, uh, there is an opportunity here for you also to dedicate yourself. Uh, it's been such a pleasure for me to watch the church in the last little while and to see the way the generations have, have uh, fed into each other and loved each other well. Um, and I just see it, uh, just a, a growing of true family in this place. Uh, not a segmentation of generations, but you know, you see the youth in with the children helping. Um, you see our golden era people. What is the, I guess, our seniors, I guess. <laughs> um, it, but just in our, in our life groups, in our day-to-day church life, it's just been a beauty to watch the generations and, and, and how they've evolved and grown. And so uh, there is an immediate family. There's also a church family. And so as we pray, I want to encourage you to, to lean in with your hearts, to dedicate yourselves also. Uh, Asher has had the privilege of being born to two great parents, and he's also had the privilege to be born into a church family that's going to love him as a community. So let's pray. Stretch out your hands if you'd like, but stretch out your hearts. Father God, we confirm over this little man uh, that he is blessed. God, that he has two wonderful parents that have stood in the gap for him that are going to raise him according to your ways. God, we thank you and we confirm your authority over them, God, that you have placed a special hand of authority in their lives over this little one. Asher will grow up, he'll have coaches, he'll have mentors, he'll have friends, but he's only going to have two parents. And there is a special place of authority that you have placed in Joel and Tanya and Sonia to steward Asher to love him, to see the best in him, to advocate for him, to pray, uh, to truly stand in the gap, God, and to pray your best, God, as he develops. And God, for this little one, God, we confirm what Joel and Sonia have prayed. We pray your blessing on him, that he would be blessed to know you, to know that he is loved, to grow up and experience your blessing firsthand. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. And God, I just pray. Um, I thank you that Asher will always know belonging because of his family, God, because of Joel and Sonia and his brothers and sister. But God, I also pray that he would know the belonging of a church family and a belonging into the family of God. I just pray, God, that as he grows, that that would just be solidified in his heart. God, that he would just remember um, the, the ident- that he would feel the identity that comes when he belongs in Jesus' name. Right, so Jesse Hare, come on up. He comes on up and gets settled. Have you all enjoyed Romans so far? Yes, yes, the kids have. And just want to take the opportunity to encourage you all, uh, just with Romans, it is a meaty book. Uh, There is a lot in every chapter, and uh, I know we've said it before, we want to continue to say it. We want to encourage you to use this, to lean in, read, get something from it yourselves. Uh, We've made the choice not to go through verse by verse. If we did, we'd probably be doing this series for about three or four years. Uh, So instead, we're doing a snapshot from each chapter. Uh, but but if you want to dig in, you will get a very rich uh, blessing from that. My wife and I have done that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jesse's going to be continuing on speaking on Romans 6 today. So open your minds, open your hearts, get yourselves ready, open your Bibles. And I'm going to pray and we're going to receive the word. God, mm. thank you for this son in the house. Thank you for his heart and his dedication and his willingness to prepare God. I thank you, God, that you have a word to us, yes. God. We yes, open God. our hearts to you, knowing that every time we meet with you, every time we read your word and encounter what you say, God, Amen. it has the opportunity Thanks, to change our lives, right. to shift us, 
to, to break down walls, God, yes. to set us on higher ground, to cause us to see things in a different way. We open ourselves up to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yes, sir. Awesome. Good morning, good morning. Am I on? Am I live? I'm live. Good morning. What a special time we've already had this morning. So some brought back some oldies in worship. It was so sweet, so good to, to hear. I've been trying to focus a little bit more as we worship to not just to not just worship in the song, but to worship in the lyrics. And, and such amazing lyrics that come out of these songs of, of God's love, how he loves us, that we are no longer a slave to fear, that, that we have been set free, that, that we, can, we can bask in his love and how great is our God. Just amazing lyrics that, uh, th- that have come out this morning. And I'm just so blessed. And thanks, Sweets, for, for dedicating. And what a, what a great time to um, just to dedicate our kids to the Lord. And, uh, and to just, just be as a family and to dedicate. It's so amazing. So sorry as, as I get myself set up here. I promised myself that I wouldn't go back to the slideshow. Because last time I did, it felt like it was a little bit much. And I got distracted. And I hope that I don't distract you. But I felt like I wanted to, to create something here that, um, uh, that needed to be visualized. So... Um, yeah, so forgive me if that, if that gets distracting. I just have to, I'm not as experienced in this as Ken Gill is, so. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to lose my presenter notes, but that's fine. I want to read, I want to read a joke to you this morning, so we can lighten the mood a little bit. A drunk man stumbles along a baptismal service on a Sunday afternoon down by the river. He proceeds to walk down into the water and stands next to the preacher. The minister turns and notices the man and says, Mister, are you ready to find Jesus? The man looks back and says, Yes, preacher, I sure am. The minister then dunks the fellow under the water and pulls him right back up. Have you found Jesus? The preacher man asks. No, I didn't, said the man. The preacher then dunks him down under for quite a bit longer and brings him up and says, Now, brother, have you found Jesus? He says, No, I didn't, reverend. The preacher, in frustration, holds the man down under for at least about 30 seconds. This time, brings him up out of the water and says in a strong tone, My good man, have you found Jesus yet? The drunk man wipes his eyes and asks the preacher, Are you sure this is where he fell in? <laughs> Oh, boy. Have you found Jesus yet, brother? Well, that joke is funny and all, um, but it does have some, some reference to what I want to speak about this morning. And as you know, we've been, we've been going through Romans 6 and, um, sorry, the Romans series, and today we're going to be jumping in onto Romans, Romans 6. So if you want to turn to your Bibles, you can, you can do that now. Um, it's been such an such a amazing time, and as John said, to, uh, to dive into Romans, um, we are not doing an exhaustive verse by verse, and like he said, it would take years and years, but I'm hoping that you guys are getting something out of this. I'm hoping that there's something that helps you to dive in further on your own. That is our, that is our cry, is that this helps you guys to, to dive in further on your own and to, uh, and in, to get into some, um, to some study and some deep um, meditation within the Lord. And so just a quick recap as we kind of go through this. Um, Sorry, I have to see my notes, so I'm just going to let you guys all see my notes as well. Oh, I just, I just don't like these sometimes. It's okay. Take your time. There we go. 1045, 28, and we are starting now. Take off. Okay. Oh, Ken, he's going to watch this, and he's going to be like, Jesse, what are you doing, buddy? Okay, so here we go. Romans 1, we, we kind of jumped into... Um, into the justification through faith in Christ alone. So Romans 1 just really gives us an introduction. It gives us an understanding that we cannot do this on our own. It is not by our works that we are saved. It is by Christ and him alone and what he has done. And we are justified by him. And, uh, and then jumping into to Romans 2, we, uh, Paul, Paul just accelerates on that and, that, um, and that he establishes that sin is sin. Whether you are a Jew or the Gentile, whether you are saved or unsaved, sin is sin. 
and that we are to judge lightly because God will judge fairly. And then in Romans 3, we, we kind of, again, just continue on into, into the, the, the areas of sin and we learn and understand that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. That every single one of us has been born into a corrupted seed and that we've all fallen short of his glory and that God will be, is the righteous judge. And uh, Krista did a, did a great job of just explaining the, that the truth is objective, that the truth transcends our understanding of truth, that, that we must understand that God is the truth and therefore he has to judge. It's hard sometimes for us to, to see God as a judge, but he is a righteous judge. He's not, he's not like a judge we see that, that ju- doesn't judge fairly, he judges fairly and righteously. And then we jump over into Romans 4 and we're, we're looking into and, and Paul kind of comes back into the promise of faith. That, that he comes back and says that, that the promise is realized through faith. That 2,000 years ago before Jesus, Abraham was justified through faith. And so he just, he just continues to, to give promises and to, to focus in on us, on us understanding that, guys, this thing is about faith. The overarching theme of Romans is about faith. And then we dive into Romans 5, and, and I loved how this kind of came upon on Good Friday and then, and then into Resurrection Sunday, and John did a great job of, of just sharing with us the, the hope that transcends us, the certainty of hope. And Paul reminds us that in Romans 5 that, that, um, that we, are, we, we have a hope, and the hope is not in who we are again, but it is in the Lord, and it is in Jesus, and it transcends everything else. Because you cannot hope in something that is created or something that, that is the same as you are. You have to hope in something that is higher. And so here we are. We're jumping into Romans 6. <clears throat> Let's read it together. What I want to do is I want to focus in on, um, on a portion of this scripture. So I want to read it together. And then I want to just, just highlight something in, within that um, as, as we go on. So let's read together. It starts in Romans 1. Sorry, Romans 6. Verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can he who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in the resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. How many of you actually understood what I just said? Maybe some of you did. Hello. You're going to help me? Thanks, Joel. You're amazing. The teacher. This man is, thank you. Just think, I'm going to cry. Um, how many of you understood what, what I just said there? It's, there's a lot in there. And what I want to do is I want to I unpack that a little bit so that we can kind of, we can kind of understand what Paul's saying. And I think that, that we have to understand baptism before we can understand what, what Paul is trying to say in Romans. And, um, and what, what, what he's trying to say here is that, <clears throat> is that through baptism, that I'm getting ahead of myself. I don't want to do that. So we have to understand baptism in order to understand Romans 6. And that's where I'm leaving it. It's okay. Nice. We did it just in time. Okay. Thank you, Joel. <clears throat> this is terrible. I probably won't ever go back to this because it just distracts me way too much. So anyway, let's go into it. So the baptism <clears throat> that, we're, that we're looking at here, so we're not doing an exhaustive teaching of baptism. Um, there's many different forms of baptism, um, but I highly recommend that you go through a foundations course, which touches on Hebrews 6 foundations. It goes through a lot of the baptisms that, that, um, that come from uh, from salvation. Um, but what I want to do is I want to focus on the believer's baptism. So it's a, it's a baptism into death 
and then, and then coming up in resurrection into the newness of life. So we're focusing here on, on the believer's baptism, which is also a water baptism, which is a rite of passage. It's a ceremonial um, uh, action that is taken that is a connection between you and faith, and it's, and it's a rite of passage into salvation. It's very important, but it does not give you salvation. Let's make that clear. Baptism is absolutely crucial and it is important, but we know from Romans 1 that we're justified through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's it. You could do that and be fine. But what this is, is it's a baptism that I will show you as we walk through this thing that, that helps you to, to um, engage in the next level of your intimacy with Jesus. It's exciting. So we know that Jesus was baptized. Um, we know that, G- that John baptized Jesus, John the Baptist, not John over here. John baptized Jesus, and, uh, and, and he needed to do that to fulfill the scriptures, the prophecy of the Old Testament. But what happens there was many things, but, but what, what was really beautiful for me was that, <clears throat> was that this was the start of Jesus' ministry, was that when he was baptized, it was the surrendering of him, of, of, sorry, it was the start of his ministry and then the confirmation of his identity from the Father. So we know that when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, that, that God showed up and he said with an audible voice, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. I think it's important for us to remember that, that, it, that this is what happens when, when we continue to copy what Jesus is doing, is that our identity gets affirmed with who the Father says, he, says we are. So we're talking about the baptism into death. So here you are living your life. You're walking along the road, and I know some of you are thinking, I want to take a knee and maybe shoot that buck. This is you just living your life. The birds are out, the mountains, it's just... It's just you walking along, living your life. And we can say that's me, because that looks like me. Tried to find somebody that was, resembled me. And all of a sudden, you, God interrupts your life. Somewhere along the lines, God interrupts your life, and, and you hear the gospel. You hear the good news. And I hope by now that we've heard the good news, but, but the good news is that, is that the universe is expanding, which therefore it had a beginning, which means it had to have a creator. And so if, if science has already explained that the universe is expanding and had to have a beginner, therefore the creator had to have been outside of time, matter, and space, which means that there's a God. That's already settled. There's a God that is out there. But what, what we need to understand in the gospel is that the God is a creator who created you in his image. And he created you in his image, and he's so perfect that he, he needed... He needed us to be created in his image, which was created out of relationship for relationship. And so if God is a creator, and we know that, that we can see that through the attributes of this world, that we can see the beauty of his creation, we can also see it then the beauty of us, in who we are, and how the babies are formed, and how, our, how everything works perfectly together. And out of relationship, we actually... Are, were born into a corrupted seed. And so you were born into Adam, which was the first man on earth, and sinned, and therefore you were born into sin by no fault of your own. And therefore you understand that, okay, well, God's here, and he's a creator, and he's beautiful and wonderful, and he created me in his image. I'm pretty awesome, except for the fact that I'm, I'm sinned. I'm sinful. I've, I've sinned, I've disobeyed God, and we know that through even our actions, that we've disobeyed God. So therefore, there has to be a mediator between us and God, because what we've learned in Romans is that God is a righteous judge, and that sin is sin, and that it actually corrupts your relationship with God. So therefore, there has to be a mediator, and his name is Jesus Christ. And historically, Jesus has already been proven. He's been proven to live a life here on earth, has has over 500 eyewitnesses of accounts in the gospel that he has been um, historically proven through, through many other um, uh, historians outside of the Bible. We know that this is true. But now the, the question is, is Jesus a liar? Is he a lunatic or is he Lord? So he either lied because he said he was God. He's either a lunatic because he said he was God or he's Lord. And so you have to come to this grips of hearing the gospel that that you come from God and into Jesus and then understanding, okay, well, if Jesus is Lord, then what's he calling me to do? And we know this from Romans 1 and and that he's calling us to surrender our life. He's calling us to 
to ask for forgiveness of our sins and take on his life because he died on a cross for our sins. He rose again three days later, defeating death. And what you have to understand is historically also that Jesus was not born of the corrupted seed. He was born of an incorrupted seed, a born of a virgin birth, okay, so that, so that he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't born into sin. And so we go through all of that and you're hearing the good news and you're understanding this, that this is Jesus and that yes, he is the Lord and Savior. I believe this in my heart and I confess it with my tongue and now I have faith and I'm justified by faith. But that's not the end of it. The good news is explained to you and right here you have a choice. You have a choice to either continue walking and hearing the good news and this is where I think a lot of people um, stumble and and continue on in life after hearing the good news and having an experience and they don't make a choice and the choice here is to surrender your life this is what the baptism represents it represents a surrendered life and you can see my man down there in the chalk he surrendered his life by the utmost so what happens is that you go down into the pit and you say you say jesus i believe that you are who you say you are I am going to die to myself because a baptism, something has to die in order to something else to come to life. So what you're doing is you're identifying the need to copy Christ and to lay down your life, submission to the word of God, so you're submitting to the word of God by faith, and then you're buried with Christ into the waters. And the waters are, are a representation of, of the cleansing that happens. Okay, and then, and then what happens is that you surrender your life and you bury yourself. This is very important, and this is what Paul's trying to say, that the burial is, is crucial. Because that man that you once were over here when you're living your life, oh, you can't see, <laughs> is not the man that is going to come up out of the waters, right? The drunk man was looking for Jesus and he couldn't find him. But maybe he should have went down a little, a little further. But what happens here is that you surrender your life and then you emerge. You emerge a new creation. You're now a new creature in Christ. And so you can see my man up there. He, he also maybe looks like me a little bit in a suit and tie. And, uh, and he's colored. He's, he's vibrant. He's living life now to the fullest. And John 3 talks about being born. Jesus talks about being born again. He's talking to, to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a, was a, a teacher of teachers. He was, he was the scribe. He was, he was the man that knew the word of God. And he sat down with Jesus on a rooftop and he said, he said Jesus, what is it? What is this, this way to life? What, what are you doing here with these disciples? And, uh, and Jesus replies to him and he says that you have to be born again. He says, what is the way to life? You have to be born again, Nick. And, and, and he says, well, well, Jesus, that doesn't make sense because how can I go into my mother's womb again? And Jesus says something so amazing. He says, truly I tell you that what is born of the flesh is of the flesh and what is born of the spirit is of the spirit. And this, this goes back into the gospel because what is born of the flesh, what do we know about Adam? We know that Adam was a corrupted seed. And so we are born of the flesh, which means we're born into a corrupted seed. So in order to have this newness of life, we have to be born again and this is all part of this this ritual that you could call it of, of baptism is that you're being born again so what happens is second corinthians 5 16 it says that if anyone is in christ he's a new creation the old is dead and behold the new has come so you've been baptized into christ's death you're born again your spirit becomes alive in christ so now here you are walking in the newness of life you're set free from sin you're no longer a slave to sin as that song was mentioning today we're no longer a slave to fear you're no longer a slave to the things that you used to do so you've been baptized you've died with Christ and you now are resurrected and you live with him now so the body of sin has been brought to nothing this is scriptural. We'll go back and read it again. Paul says that the body of sin has been brought to nothing. That word nothing means nothing. <laughs> it's nothing. It's dead. So, so it, and I love the words that are used. You have to understand the words. It's, it's the burial. 
which means when you go to a funeral, you put the casket in, you close the casket, you lower the casket, and you fill it with dirt, and you say your piece, and that's it. There's no longer anything that's going to happen there. It's buried. It's dead, and there's nothing that, no power that that thing has over, over you anymore. But, so here you are, you're living your life, you've heard the gospel, you surrendered your life, you've now come down into the waters, you've, you've, com- you've, you've made this connection with Jesus and you've united with him and you've brought yourself to death just like he did and you said, okay, Jesus, and as you come out of the waters, there's this cleansing that happens, the Holy Spirit touches you and you are cleansed and then you come out a new man, a new woman, a new creature in Christ. Your spirit, because we're body, soul, and spirit, you're always body, soul, and spirit, but what happens is that your spirit comes alive in Christ. It's always there, but it's not, it's not yet alive. It's, it's now alive in Christ. But there's still a tension. There's still this tension that happens because now you're a new creation living in a dead body with an old soul. So you're, you're walking in this new creation and the newness of life, and you can see when people come to know Jesus and get baptized, man, there's an energy There's something that happens. They're just like on fire and they're just so full of life because you're now a new creation and you're like, whoa, like coming right out of the mother's womb again. Like you're just on fire. I know I was when I came out, you know, and uh, (laughs) you're just, you're excited for life and I love that. But there's, there's always this tension. There's this battle. And this is what I think Paul is trying to address that, that how, how do we, how do we figure this battle out? Because because we're living in a, in a spirit, body, soul creation, but now scripture says that we've come alive in Christ. The body of sin is considered dead, but what then shall we say? Let's read it again. Let's see if we can kind of capture this a little bit more and it might make a little more, more sense. So what then shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, explanation mark. I want you to read this with me. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him, so if we've connected our lives with him, if we've been united with him, a death like his, we shall certainly also be united in a resurrection like his. So we know that the old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that we would no longer be enslaved to the sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Does that make, it makes a little bit more sense when we read it in that perspective, at least for me it does. We're still living in this tension. See, I can relate quite well to this tension up here. That's why I drew myself. I drew myself in black and white, and then I drew myself dead, and then I rose again in color. Um, but I can relate to this, because, because I have had a pretty radical transformation, and not everybody has, and everyone walks a different life, but I believe that if we, if we look down, we've all been radically transformed. We, we should have been radically transformed, right? No matter if you've had a, a testimony like mine, or you've been in church your whole life, somewhere along the lines, you've been transformed. But for me, I can relate to the dead and the old and the new because, because for me, my old life was filled with darkness. It was filled with, with sinful actions, darkness, self-seeking pleasures of my own, and all I was doing was that. But when I came to know Jesus and I understood to, that it was the surrender of my life that I needed to bury my old man, that he was, should be considered dead, the transformation of the new man 
was seriously a transformation. And many people here can attest to my transformation. And my wife certainly can. I would not be married to this woman if I did not go through this transition. Because what happens is that, and I love to share my testimony because many of you know me and know my story. But when I share my testimony with, with waitresses and people on the street or, or wherever we're at, they are shocked and amazed when I tell them the things that I used to do. And I don't go into detail, but I say a couple of things because I want people to know the transformation that has happened and can happen with you as a new creature of Christ. And so I, I have known this transition and, and for me, the darkness of my life has to be dead. It can no longer live. I can no longer be an enslaved to this thing. But there's still tension. There's still this like, temptation that comes up you know so, uh, the biggest thing for me is that when I drive home on a Friday afternoon and the sun's out and and I'm driving by and, and I see a bar I see a pub and everybody's hanging out and, and grabbing a beer and I can see that beer and I can see how beautiful it looks and just how wonderful it tastes and I'm like oh man and I can see that man sitting at the bar having a drink, and then two, and then three, and then getting on his phone and contemplating the night and who, which drug dealer I'm going to call and, and what drug I'm going to get and then where, which club I'm going to go to and which girl I'm going to hang out. I can see that happening, but I keep driving because I know that that man's dead. I know that that man no longer lives, that he died a long time ago, about 12 years ago, and that he's never coming back to life again. Jesus has resurrecting power, and you can raise people from the dead, but that man ain't coming back. Okay, so, so this, this tension is still here, but what is Paul trying to, trying to um, help us understand is that, is that all of us have gone through the old, the dead, and the new. Maybe not all of us. Some of us have, some of us haven't. But this is what happens when you come through the old, the dead, and the new, is that you have to consider that man dead. He can no longer have power over your life. Because when your spirit becomes alive in Christ... That is which you're going to be a slave to. And Bob Dylan says that in one of his songs. He says that we're a slave to something. You're always going to be a slave to something, whether it's the Lord or the devil. And so, so when your spirit man comes alive, that's why baptism is so important. Because we must make that surrender of life, that action, that ritual, that, 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 that says, God, I believe not only in my mind who you are, and I confess with my tongue, but through my lifestyle, I'm going to surrender to you. But how do we do it? How do we, how do we continue in this life of newness? How do we continue in this life, like Paul says, that we shouldn't sin anymore? I want to go through that with you. I want to go through three steps that I believe that will help us to continue into a newness of life. You ready for it? Boom, step one. Consider yourself dead. This is what Paul says. We need to start here. We need to consider ourselves dead. Jesus talks about it too. Pick up your cross and, and die to yourself so that you may follow me. Consider yourself dead. Romans 6 says, 6, 6 says, Our old self was crucified. The body of sin was brought to nothing. You are set free and no longer a slave to sin. So we are to think differently now. So we have to actually change the way that we're thinking and the way that, that we consider ourselves to be and that you're like, oh no, actually that guy's dead. Do you ever think like that? I don't know a lot of us do. I have to. But there, a lot of us don't think about the body being dead, the old man. So as you're walking about your life, these things are going to come up and the devil's going to try and attack you. And you're going to say, no, 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 that guy's dead. I'm no longer a slave to him anymore. That's step one. Rearrange our thinking. Step two. Listen to the right voice. We are now a new creature in Christ. We're now, a spirit is alive in him. So we must now listen to the one that is giving us life. Before, we maybe couldn't hear him as well or, or, or at all. And, and it was quiet voice, but now it should be as loud as thunder. It should be very much a yes and a no and a yes and an amen. Um, it, it's very much a listening to the right voice, which is the voice of the Father. Romans 6, 5 says that we are united with him in the resurrection like his. And so we're a new creation, we're a new, um, our spirits are alive in him, and so we're listening to him. And, and that, that old um, 
parable or analogy that I used the last time I preached on Romans 1 about this guy who had these dogs and the dogs he would bring to keep fighting and he would keep betting on the dogs to which dog would win. And, and some guy said, well, how do you know which dog is going to win? And he says, it's the one that I feed. So it's, it's the dog that you feed. It's, it's the man in the spirit that you feed that's going to have the loudest voice. So when you're feeding in the word of God and you're feeding in the, in the what, is, what is true and what is pure and what is right, you're feeding on the voice of God and then the voice of God becomes more clear and it becomes more evident in your life. We're united with him and then we have the resurrection like him. And number three, which is my favorite, is that we are to create a strategy for our old habits. We can't just go on life thinking that things are not going to attack us and try and bring us down and that, okay, now that we are surrendered and baptized, everything's all good. Your life actually gets harder. <laughs> and so we have to create in our minds and our lives strategies in order to, in order to um, create godly habits and create good habits. And so I love, I love this, this thing. I love learning about the mind and, and how we operate and how, how we function as human beings and how and how we can actually have control over our mind. We can have control over our body and what we do with our lives. I think a lot of us just kind of go about life. But when you actually sit down and you say, okay, I can actually, I can have control over this thing. I can, I can do this thing. I can now, I can now um, become successful by the things that I do. So we, we all have habits, right? Our, we, everybody has these habits. I think the problem is, is that we're so used to those old habits of the old self that they just kind of come and drag along with us when we become a new creation. And God says that that has to change. I know for me, it, 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 it was definitely habits that were, that were the old creation coming into the new. But um, Teresa had, had referenced this book when she, when she did her preach. It's called The Winning the War in Your Mind. And it's a beautiful book. I suggest that you, that you get it if you're interested in this kind of thing. But it's, it's by a Christian author. It's one of the best sellers right now, I think, or was. Um, but he talks about, about the battle in our mind and that, and that this thing is, is a constant tension between the old and the new. And that we're always, we're always trying to overcome the things that are going on in our mind. And how do we do that? And how do we identify with those strongholds and the things that, that kind of slip us up? And, and so he does a great job at, at, at uh, explaining this. But one thing that I've always, I've always kind of um, found interesting with the books that I read, neurologically, that, um, that in, our, in our brains, we, we have neurological pathways. And these neurological pathways are, if you can picture like a hot, um, a hot metal ball that just gets dipped into butter. And it's like it creates this rivet. And so this rivet is, is exactly what happens in our mind. And so we create in our mind these neurological pathways that go from A to B, A to B, A to B. And you can see this sometimes if you look at motocross tracks. If you look at, uh, I like motocross, but w when they're going down in the tracks and they just continue to go down and down and down over again, they create ruts. They create ruts in, in, uh, in the dirt. And that's what happens in our brain. We, we, we create these habits that that end up just creating these strongholds and your brain will find the absolute easiest way to get from A to B. It will not try any harder to get from A to B. And so what we have to do is we actually have to create a strategy in order to come out of these old habits. So you have to pick yourself up out of that trench and create a new habit and it's not easy. It's one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do, trying to create new habits. But it's important that we do that because we have to see the old man is dead and we can no longer live the way that we used to live when we have been baptized into Christ's death. The definition of maturity is delaying the pleasures of now. So the definition of actually being a mature adult <laughs> is delaying pleasures. It doesn't mean that you can't have the pleasures, but it's delaying them for the now so that you can see what the future will be. See, change, it's like a muscle. We have to work it out. We have to work out the change. We have to work out our mind in order to actually come out a better person. Um, someone, someone once said that if you picture yourself in five years, be that person now and you'll start to, to become that person. So if you see yourself in five years, wherever you want to be, be that person now. So for us as believers, we want to see ourselves as an eternal being. See yourself as the eternal being in heaven because that's where you're going to end up 
and be that person now. Be that spirit that is alive now because this thing is not coming with you. It's dead. It's buried. So be that person now. See yourself as an eternal being, like Paul says, that your, your spirit living in a tent. This tent is temporary. Um, there's many other books on, on habits and, and creating, you know, 30-day challenges and things like that. It takes roughly about 30 days to create a new habit or to let go of an old habit. So here's my challenge. My challenge would be, as we go through Romans and as we're kind of going into this into this creating new habits or, or, or letting go of the old and, and behold the new, maybe we take a 30-day challenge and it's to read Romans or it's to memorize a scripture or it's do something for 30 days that's easy enough for you to do and see how your life changes. See how things change when you start to create new habits and get rid of the old. Um, uh, there's a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear, and, and he says it's so easy if you just start off with the little things. You start off with, with, a, with a minute of reading, and then go to two minutes, and then three minutes, or whatever that is. Creating yourself something that's going to get rid of the old and, 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 be, and create in yourself godly habits. I think that's important. I think that, that, you know, Paul's not talking about habits here, but what I think he is in a sense, because for me, habits, and I think for a lot of us, what do they lead to? What do, what do bad habits lead to? They lead to sin. They, they end up leading to some sort of sin. Sin is never usually a moment that happens. It's usually a gradual thing. And so I think if we can create strategies in our mind to have habits that are godly and to continue to listen to the right voice while considering that other man dead, we're creating habits that will enhance our spirit, man, that will hear God more clearly and we will live a much better life. So consider yourself dead, listen to God, and make a plan. This is my challenge for us today as we wrap up Romans 6. Again, this is not an exhaustive teaching, and if you are interested in some of the baptisms and, and, what, and what the baptism is and, and all of this, um, definitely come and talk to, talk to me or talk to one of, one of the elders, but also... Uh, email the office and say, hey, I'd like to do foundations. Foundations course covers a lot of this, Hebrews 6 foundations. Um, but but we, we, we as believers um, need to be baptized into Christ's death. I think it's absolutely crucial. We, we have to consider the old man dead because, um, because we need to walk in the newness of life. So Father, thank you for, for this morning and I thank you... Um, for Joel Sweet helping me out with technology. <laughs> Thank you for these amazing hearts here this morning. God, I just pray, Lord, that you would touch and help to renovate our minds and our bodies. And God, that you would um, continue to make alive the spirit that is in you, God. And that, that we, would, we would continue to lay down our life for you, continue to surrender our life. We would die daily, as Paul says. And that we would bury ourselves in, in the death of Christ and be raised up in the resurrection, united with you in the newness of life, God. What a beautiful, powerful thing that is, God, to be baptized in you. Lord, I pray that, um, yeah, that you would just help to touch our hearts. And during these next couple of weeks, God, I pray that, that you would help to even just touch on a couple of things that maybe would help us to change the way that we think slowly and the way that we act and the way that we live our life so that we can be the best versions of who we are, which then represents who you are. We pray these things in Jesus' name. If you have anything you need prayer for, we're here. Um, we thanks for coming, and yeah, we're, we're praying for you daily, and uh, yeah. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you, church.